Welcome to the Women's Roundtable at East Carolina University. The Roundtable was founded in the spring of 2003 to acknowledge the contribution of women to the university legacy and to encourage new levels of commitment by women to the university's future. Today is the third event in our incredible women series. In 2005, we concentrated on women's health issues. 2007 brought a legacy of leadership as we honored 100 incredible ECU women as a part of the ECU Centennial. Today brings strategies for sound financial management, an emphasis on leadership, and the recognition of six more incredible women. We extend a very special welcome to our six honorees. When you see someone wearing a gold medallion and a purple ribbon, please take a moment to congratulate her for her accomplishments. We will hear from Jean Chatsky, well-known author and financial editor of today's NBC's Today Show, humorist and motivational speaker, Jeannie Robertson, and bb and chairman and CEO, Kelly King. You will have the opportunity to choose from breakout sessions presented by outstanding leaders. Please take a moment um, to notice the members of the Roundtable Board listed in your program. They have a strong commitment to ECU, the Roundtable, and to this event. I would like to publicly thank Marcy Romery, Director of Women's Philanthropy and Senior Major Gifts Officer, the main staff liaison for the Roundtable, for her extraordinary service to us. In addition, Jennifer Olson, Assistant Director of Donor Relations and Scholarship, Maureen Devine, Director of Donor Relations and Scholarship, and Women's Roundtable intern Lauren Williams, a Senior Communications Major, have provided valuable assistance. We also have a number of other student and staff volunteers helping us today, and we thank them for that. We also want to thank our sponsors for their financial support. They are listed in the program. We're especially grateful to our presenting sponsor, First Citizens Bank, who gave a gift of $25,000, and to bb and and Wachovia, who are each $10,000 donors. Their dollars, will help us fund ECU Access Scholarships, a main focus of the Roundtable. We would like for you to see a brief video about the Access Scholarship Program. Access Scholarship has been a great deal for me. Almost at the last minute, I was offered the scholarship, and that meant everything. The Access Scholarship has helped a lot because without it, I probably wouldn't be here right now. It's um, probably been like the main reason that I'm even here, probably. The Access Scholarship Program helps East Carolina University by bringing bright and talented students here who will receive their education, graduate, go back into the community as leaders, give back to the community as well as East Carolina University. They must be a North Carolina student as well as have a demonstrated academic ability and have a demonstrated financial need as determined by our financial aid office. The Access Scholarship Award is a $2,500 award per semester for each student who receives the scholarship. The volunteer component of the Access Scholarship Program allows students to give back to the community and instill the community service value early in their college career. I learned 
that the world is not about me. I learned that no matter what my situation is, there's always somebody that's not as well off as I am. I worked with disabled children at my old high school. Um, last year I worked at the food bank. I had to sort through a lot of nasty sweet potatoes. But it helped me open my eyes a lot because before then I, I can be sort of negative sometimes. So it helped me realize that there are a lot of people that do a lot of good. I really learned how organizations appreciate volunteers and how much they're needed. Like I didn't, I never, I've volunteered before, but I've never really realized until this year like how much how the help is appreciated and how grateful the organizations are. I find these students to be individuals who very much want to attend college and perform well academically, and they also have a financial need that if we did not assist financially, they may not be able to attend college. I've received so much joy from coming here that I would like to see many, many other students come through and achieve um, academic success and the joy of life by just being in East Carolina. Their help is really appreciated. and. It helps a lot of kids out that, you know, really try hard in school to make it, but, you know, have financial problems that they need to help them still get through school. Thank you very much. It's just really changed my life in a whole other way, just to be able to come to college and not have the stress of the financial part of it and just being able to focus on what I'm here to do. Thanks a ton, because without you, I probably wouldn't be here. And I hope that one day I can be a donor and give back to students like me. East Carolina has a long history of giving back to the community as well as to the state of North Carolina. Our motto is to serve and this Access Scholarship Program allows us to continue serving the students of North Carolina.
that uh, it is just huge what you, you and others have been able to do to make that possible. I thank you for all the hard work. Uh, you provide the margin of excellence for our future. Uh, we really believe that we have a unique mission and we're being successful in it and we're holding ourselves accountable to measure whether we're serving the state and our region. I believe we're doing it. Please continue to help. Continue to help with private giving if you can. Continue to help with your time and continue to help with your leadership. That's what we are about. That's what our students are expected to be tomorrow's leaders and they see great models in this room. And you can help us continue uh, our goal, which is to give every student a significant opportunity for leadership development. Uh, you're doing so much. You make me very proud, and I'm happy to be a small part of a great day with uh, multiple great speakers, great panels, uh, honoring six more incredible women. So uh, I'm very happy to be here, and thanks for helping with all you do.
at the end of the day, so you need to register at the First Citizens table out at the front. Events like today just don't happen by themselves, and you know that. If you've ever planned an event like this, you know it takes a lot of people. But there are nine specific people that I really want to thank. And so when you see them today and you see their names, please go up and thank them. Um, I, it takes a huge group of people that are very motivated, very energized, and who have the ability to mobilize people very quickly. And I'd like to mention who those faces are. My committee, Angela Allen, Wanda Bunch, Kay Chalk, Jennifer Little, Mary Newton, and Mary Plyman. And then you heard Kay mention Marcy Romery early, earlier um, when she was up here. And Marcy, I'm not sure where you're sitting, but um, you're, you're a godsend. And without you and your three angels, Jennifer, Lauren, and Maureen, I'd have jumped off a cliff weeks ago, literally weeks ago. So thank you so much. Our presenting sponsor today is First Citizens. And since I happen to have a little connection there, I'm very thrilled to introduce to you one of our chief executive officers. He's at the very top of the house, and that person happens to be a woman. Very thrilled to say that. Hope Holding Canal is president of Ironstone Bank. Let me say that again. She's president of Ironstone Bank, a subsidiary of North Carolina-based First Citizens Bank shares. She's also executive vice president and um, business services executive of First Citizens Bank. That's a mouthful. And she oversees everything from our business services group to treasury services, international banking, working capital finance, leasing, and the insurance group. In 2005, she was named the first woman to ever chair the North Carolina Bankers Association. And she's a native of Smithfield, North Carolina. And she earned her bachelor's degree and her MBA at UNC Chapel Hill which hope, I'm not going to hold that against you today for being from um, Orange County Community College, but just remember you are surrounded by pirates. So, um, hope, please come up and help me welcome this lovely group of folks. Hope, Safest and soundest banking institutions in our country, 
and stewardship of our clients' financial assets has been a hallmark of our organization and continues to be one of our top priorities. Today's event is a reflection of First Citizens' dedication to women. We're grateful to the many women who work in our organization and who actually make up the majority of our workforce. We're proud of the many contributions we make each year to support women's initiatives like this and the countless volunteer hours our associates spend on these kinds of nonprofits. We think that it's important to participate in programs like this, and it's our strong belief that we all take a stake in creating a better environment here and across the United States by bringing greater awareness about important financial issues to the forefront. Our sincere hope is that you'll leave here today enlightened and empowered to make a difference in your life. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy today's session.
and has been active in the university school of business. He's a shining example of leadership wherever he chooses to serve. We thank him for taking the time from his busy schedule to speak with some business students just prior to coming on stage and for sharing his thoughts on leadership and finance with us this afternoon. Kelly? You go home and you talk to your uh, husband or significant other, 
He said, you know, I was hearing this old speaker today. He was talking about you. He said, honesty should be should be absolute. And, and your spouse, well, I've seen that other looks up at you. He said, well, well, honey, are you absolutely honest with me? And you look back and say, well, I sure am, Lord. I'm honest with you, you know, 98, 99% of the time. But well, that raises a very important question, though. What 1% of the time are you not honest with me? And if it's 1% of the time that you're not honest with me, how can I completely trust you? And if I can't completely trust you, how can I completely depend on you? How can we have a mutually supported, mutually independent relationship? How does that work? It does not work. And so at the end of the day, in the beginning discussion of values, I believe we have to get centered on the fact that being honest about ourselves and honest with others uh, is very, very important and critical in life. And integrity is about being consistent in living out honesty and all of your other values. For example, you can't say, well, okay, I'll be honest uh, Monday through Friday. I'll just take off on Saturday and Sunday. That didn't work so well either, right? So to be a person of integrity, you should live out your values consistently so that you can ultimately be successful and happy. And so then we want people to use good judgment. And in, in order to be a high achiever in life, you need to exercise good judgment. And judgment is about reality, dealing with the facts of the situation, reasoning, thinking through the issue, and doing it independently, having the courage to make your own decision. But most people say, well, that makes sense. I mean, everybody kind of does that, right? No, it's not right. Most people today, especially, never do take the time to personally themselves search out, search out and seek out the facts of the situation at hand. And even if they do have the facts at hand, most people will not take the time and have the commitment to reason through, think through carefully those facts and draw an independent uh, conclusion, have the courage to make your own decision. Indeed, if you think I'm wrong about this, you go out here on the street today and you ask a hundred people a, a, a question of importance of some matter today, and I'll get you over 95% of the times. You will get an answer. But the answer would more than likely be something that somebody told them, they saw on TV, they read in the paper. It will almost never be something that they themselves sought out the facts, thought it through carefully, and made their own decision. It's one of the biggest problems in America today people are listening to others, leading them down, leading them down as they may not consider to be good uh, because they don't take the time to think through for themselves. So that's about exercising good judgment in life. Well, what is success? Well, success is about the individual commitment to act. It's about the individual productivity. It's about what you do in life, what you get done. Uh, and then it's really about turning your attention to those that you work with and what are the organizational uh, setting you're in, work or community or whatever, working with others so that you help the team achieve all that it can attain. So produce all that you can produce and then turn your attention to the team, help them be as successful as they can possibly be, and then have a wholesome understanding and commitment to the notion of justice so that people will really uh, understand that those that produce the most should earn the most. So we believe that is what creates a sense of, of, of success in life. But what is it that uh, sometimes causes people that are very successful not to be happy? Why is it that many times in life people that have great successes, they accumulate great titles, great compensations, great balance sheets, and yet they're very miserable in life? It's because happiness is not necessarily directly related to success. Because happiness is about a sense of self-esteem and pride in how you live your life. Self-esteem is that really important, internal, intrinsic, warm feeling you get about how you live your life. It is something that you can only do for yourself. That's why we call it self-esteem. You know, a lot of times people get this confused. You hear parents all the time say, well, you know, little Joe, little Mary doesn't have much self-esteem. i got to figure out how to get them some self-esteem. It doesn't work that way. If someone else could give you self-esteem, we wouldn't call it self-esteem. We'd call it we esteem or they esteem or some other kind of esteem, right? It's self-esteem because you can only get it for yourself. And, and the challenge in life is to figure out how to get your own self-esteem. And what I've realized recently is that self-esteem is a very practical process of how you live life. So what happens in life is you 
come along and you have nugget, what I call nuggets of opportunity. These nuggets of opportunity come along and they're oftentimes very sporadic, <clears throat> maybe one a day, one a month, one a, uh, a quarter. And they also come along and it's typically something that needs to be done. It's something that you're typically not told to do. You're not responsible for doing it. You're not paid for doing it. And many times, nobody in the world even knows you did it except you. And the question becomes whether or not you grab a hold of that nugget of opportunity and do it to the best of your ability or not. And if you do, you have a sense of raising your self-esteem because you feel good about yourself for having done it because it needed to be done, not because somebody told you to do it. On the other hand, if you don't grab a hold of those nuggets of opportunity, you lower your self-esteem. I had a, a personal experience with this very recently. My mother-in-law, who's been 92 years old now and, and can only get around in a wheelchair, uh, so this area, that the place she lives, uh, there was about a 10, 12 inch drop from the living room down to the sidewalk, and we were having trouble getting her in and out in the wheelchair. So I got out there, we got my materials, got out there one day, and, and built this ramp for her to be able to go down. <clears throat> and as I was just finishing up this ramp, this nice elderly gentleman came rolling up in his wheelchair. Uh, he obviously had, had paralysis, his knees were, legs were with her, maybe some polio or something. But this very nice gentleman, he came up and he started looking at my ramp. He said, did you build that? And I said, well, yes, sir, I did. He said, that's a really, really good looking ramp. He said, I've never took it down. And he said, your ramp looks much better than my ramp. He said, it's wider than mine. He said, mine's so narrow, I run off the side a lot get in trouble. And he said, look at that. He said, I see if you screws it, screw it together, and that really is better because mine had the nails, the nails pop up and catch it on the wheel. And he said, I really like the way you attach it to the house so that it won't move around on me. Mine's not attached. It moves around. Sometimes I'll fall off of it. And, you know, he was sitting there describing this ramp that I was building. I was looking there, and I was saying, well, that is a pretty good ramp. <laughs> I feel pretty good. So I was having a pretty good shot of ego there. I was feeling pretty but I almost missed the nugget of opportunity. And so then I finally forced me, I said, this man needs a ramp, and I can't do it. So I said, I'll build you a ramp. He said, no kidding. He said, how much would it cost? I said, well, it cost you a dime. I'll build you a ramp. So I went away the next week, got my materials, came back from Sunday afternoon. I got out there, took about an hour and a half, built the ramp. I got through building the ramp. He took his full wheelchair and went up and down, up and down, and then just like a kid at Christmas. He was so happy. At this time, I was standing there with just a deep sense of pride and sense of self-esteem and having done something that was worth doing. And I didn't get paid for it. Nobody told me to do it. I did my job description. And I felt good about myself. And now every time when I go back about every week and see my mother-in-law, you know what the first thing I do? I look down there and see that ramp. Every time I see that ramp, I get a little lift in my self-esteem. Now, if I had missed that nugget of opportunity, if I had gone in there and I had not done it, you know what would have happened? Every time when I would go over there, I would look down at that ramp, and I'd get a little negative in my self-esteem because I wouldn't feel good because I know what they've done. And that's the way life is. If you go through life and you grab these nuggets of opportunity, and look, nobody's perfect, nobody's going to get them all, but if you'll grab as many of those nuggets of opportunity as you can, if you'll do it to the best of your ability, then when you, as you're going through life, you will be one of the lucky ones who can look back over your life and you will develop a sense of justly earned pride in how you have lived your life. And as you go through towards the life's life's end and look back, you will be one of the folks in, in this world, uh, in, the, in the minority, unfortunately, who can be justly happy about how you lived your life because you have this strong sense of self-esteem and how you lived your life, what you've done, how you've impacted other people in life, You'll feel justly proud about how you've done that and, and, and the fact and the contributions that you've made to hundreds of thousands of people. And so that's what happiness in life looks like. And so the challenge in life is to earn that happiness. Uh, but it turns out that there are other aspects of success and achievement that also affect our self-esteem. And this particularly applies in the workplace, but it applies across the board. So my observation over life has been that there are five characteristics of outstanding achievements. Five characteristics of outstanding achievements. The number one is that they believe absolutely to their toes in what it is they're trying to accomplish. You take Olympians, for example, who will practice eight to ten hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year for years and years and years. You won't find
mind is a Lincoln running around saying, well, you know, I think I can be number 13 in the world. They believe to their toes that they can be number one, the best of the best of what it is they are doing. And it is that deep belief in what they are trying to do that creates the second characteristic of, of outstanding achievers, and that is that they commit the time, energy, and resources to make it happen. See, here's what happens in life. We commit ourselves to what we believe in. Now, a lot of times in life, you hear people say, you know, I believe in this or I believe in that. Then you watch what they do. If they don't commit their time, their energy, their resources to make it happen, you know, in spite of what they say, they do not believe. Because as human beings, we will commit ourselves to that that we deeply believe in. And that deep belief carried through that commitment is translated by high achievers into the third characteristic, which is to train ourselves so that we indeed have the best skills of what we're doing. Because at the end of the day, what really matters in the real world, to the real world, is how will you do what you do? How good a golfer are you? How good a tennis player are you? How good a bank are you? How good a school teacher are you? It's your skill set that makes the difference relative to the skill sets of others. But you're never going to have an outstanding skill set unless you're willing to train yourself relentlessly to have the best skills. And you're never going to train yourself relentlessly unless you deeply believe in what it is you're trying to accomplish so that it creates a strong sense of passion for the purpose that you've chosen for your life. And the reason passion is so important is because here's what happens with passion. When we are passionate about something in life, you will do all that you can do to get it done, not what you have to do. That gap is the great distinction between high achievers and marginal achievers. High achievers are passionate about their work in life. And they therefore will do all that they can do not what they have to do. And that creates this distinction, this differentiation in terms of their performance. But then the fourth characteristic about high achievers is that they enjoy the journey. This is very important for two reasons. One is that if you don't enjoy the journey, then you won't have the endurance to see it through. Because when you, when you don't really enjoy what you're doing, then you can't rekindle yourself, you can't refill yourself, because when you're doing something that's worth hard or worthwhile and you're working hard, you're doing all you can do is draining physically and emotionally. And so how do you get recharged? How do you get remotivated? How do you stay enthusiastic? How do you get that going if you're not really enjoying it? And that's what happens all the time in life. You see people that start out, you know, really rapping on the career, really rapping some aspect of life, they'll do well for a little while and then all of a sudden they fizzle out. It's because then they get that sense of joy that refuels and rekindles and gives them that level of enthusiasm to continue forward and fight through the obstacles. And then the other aspect of enjoying the journey is, I think, even more important. And that is, uh, unless you enjoy the journey, ultimately, you're wasting your life. And in the final analysis, life is very short. And I turned 62 recently. I've been working in the bank, as Katie said, for 38 years. It seemed like I just started yesterday. But yesterday I was over here with Dean Beard in the business school. Life goes by mighty fast. And the shame of it is most people never get the essence of life. And that's because most people are either living in the past or they're waiting to live in the future. The people that are living in the past are the people that are worried, angry, guilty, sad about something that happened yesterday, 5, 10, 15 years ago, Drag them down. I've heard many times, and I think you have as well, somebody will say, well, you know, I'm still mad with Joe. Why are you mad with Joe? Well, 25 years ago, he did so and so and so, and you're just describing all this anger, all this hate, and it's just dragging them down, and it's not a thing in the world that can go back. And then you have people that are living in the future. These are the people who say, well, you know, I'll be happy when the kids get out of school, or I get my loan paid off, or when they get that promotion, get that big vacation or this or that. When oh, that happens, wow, well, we're going to be happy then. Well, here's the dilemma. You can't change yesterday and not one of us in this room has the moral promise. All there is is today. And, and the challenge in life is to grab a hold of the notion that life exists now and only now. This is it. And so our bogey, our challenge in life, is to live as successfully and as happily as we can this day. 
It's about grabbing a hold of what's called the consciousness of the moment, realizing that this is it. But here's the dilemma. It's not as easy as it seems because I'm sure somebody in the room will say, well, that sounds mighty, mighty fine, Mr. Speaker, but here's the deal. You don't understand. You want me to be living successfully and happy today, but if you know how many problems I had in life, you can understand why I can't accomplish that. Well, look, all of us have challenges and problems in life. In fact, I'll bet you in a room this far, there are one or more people that in the last 24, 48 hours, something has happened that has thrown a real roadblock in your life. The phone rang, there was a doctor giving you your, your, your medical feedback from your physical, or a parent, or a neighbor, or a child. Somebody got a call, somebody got really bad news, and it knocks you to your knees. We all have those tough obstacles in life. That's not the question. The question is, what do you do when you get knocked down in life? And so we have to have a way of trying to figure out how to take this day that has its incumbent set of problems attached to it. How do we figure out a way to take this day and make the very best of it? And so what I found over life is that requires us to have an enthusiastic, positive attitude. We have to have an enthusiastic, positive attitude because it is that attitude that will help us figure out how to go over, under, through, around all the issues and the challenges in life. And so I've recommended to many people, and I'll recommend to you. Here's a good, really good exercise that you can follow. The next time life is beating you down and you're having all these negative things in your life and you just can't figure out how to pull yourself up and grab a hold of this day and go ahead and enjoy it in spite of the world around you, then you do this little exercise. You sit down at your kitchen table. You can take out a, a clean sheet of paper. You draw a line down the middle, and on the left-hand side of that sheet of paper, you write down all the things that it would take to make you happy. Well, boy, I'd be happy if I could just double my salary, or if I could get a bigger house, if I could get a bigger car, if I had a bigger title. What? all those things would really absolutely make me happy. Write all that down. And then you write down on the right hand side of the sheet of paper the God-given advantages you have in life, like the ability to walk and talk and see. And you imagine for a moment if I came along and you knew for absolute certain that I had the power, the authority, and the ability to make you this deal. Here's the deal. I'll give you all those things you want. I'm serious. Immediately. I'll give you all the money, all the titles, all the cars, all the houses. Just name it. All you have to do to get this deal is give me one of your advantages, give me your sight. And if you like, I would dare take that deal. You get up from the kitchen table, you go into the bathroom, shut the door, turn on the light, and you look yourself square in the mirror. You put your eyes just as close to the mirror as you can, and you look your, yourself square in the eyes. And you clap your hands, and you walk out of that door, and you pull, take your fingers, and you pull your lips into a really big smile and you say, I have decided. I have decided that I'm going to take control of my life. I have decided that I'm going to be an enthusiastic, positive person. I have decided that whatever my role, my responsibility in life is, I'm going to walk in the door tomorrow morning. I'm going to do everything I can humanly do to make whatever my responsibilities are as successful as they can be. I'm going to do all I can do, not what I have to do. I'm going to make everybody that I'm working for whatever my responsibilities are as successful and happy as they can be. I'm going to turn my attention to my peers, to my associates, to my teammates that I'm working with. I'm going to do everything I can to help them be as successful and happy as they are, as they can be. And you know what? If you will do that most of the days of your life, look, nobody's perfect. You know, I will get it right every day. But if you are trying to do that most of the days of your life, you will be amazed at two things. You will be amazed at how much more successful and happy in life you will be. And then you will really be surprised at how much more successful and happy the lives of thousands of people will be that you've influenced over the course of your life. And as you go through your life, and if you'll try your best to apply that enthusiastic, positive attitude philosophy, as you near life in, you'll be one of the few that can justly say that you have been successful in terms of accomplishing the things in life that you wanted to be able to accomplish. But more important, you have had a sense of happiness and that you have a strong sense of self-esteem. You feel really good, you feel justly proud about how you have lived your life.
If you will do that, then you will be surprised at how successful and happy you will be and how many thousands of lives other people will, will, will be affected. I want to just leave you with a book you all read. It's, it's a book called uh, Chasing Daylight. Uh, this is a book that was written by a gentleman who was uh, the CEO of KPMG, one of the top five largest uh, accounting firms in the, in the world. He started in the mailroom and he worked his way up and he was, I think, 43. He became CEO of the company. And after he had been CEO for two or three years, he had a headache one day, went in, and was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. The doctor told him he had 90 days to live. There was nothing that could be done. And he had the consciousness and the commitment to decide that he wanted to use his last 90 days to write a book about his experience to help other people. So he wrote Chasing Daylight. He was able to write the entire book except the last chapter. He was so close to death as his wife wrote. But he wrote about his experience. And it was really interesting because it said early on, in the first several weeks, he was just distraught about his condition. But then he quickly started moving through that. He said it was amazing. Even knowing his condition, he found that he was, his brain, his mind was going right back to thinking about, well, what was going on in KP? Wonder what's going on with that big project I was working on. And he started thinking and focusing and spending his time and energy on things that in the sense of where he was just did not matter. And so he started really focusing on what he called consciousness of the moment. He started trying to focus on taking a minute and just applying that minute to, to his family, to his friends, to do what he really wanted to do in his last days here on this earth. And he found out that as he worked more and more on it, he found out that a day became, a minute became like an hour, an hour became like a day, a day became like a month. And all of a sudden he realized he had a long time, a long time, if he was focused to make a really powerful impact on the lives of those that he loved and others that he wanted to have a positive influence on. He lived, I believe, a very successful and happy life. And that's what I wish for all of you, that in spite of where you are as you get here to this place today, in spite of all the challenges and issues in life that you have, my hope for you is that you can take a break, take a moment, and grab a hold to the consciousness of life, the brevity of life, and, and embrace, think about over the next few days, this idea that life really only exists one day at a time. And think about what you can do by getting clearly focused on what your purpose is, what's important to you, by really getting clear about what you can be passionate about, that you believe in deeply, that you can commit yourself relentlessly till you're so tired you can't even move anymore, that you'll be disciplined and committed to taking that energy and training yourself so you'll have better skills than anybody else in the world than what you do, that you'll really be committed to enjoying the journey, drawing that sense of enthusiasm and energy from knowing that you're doing something that's important, that you're passionate about, that's an important purpose in life. Understanding that enjoying life is really about, about trying to focus on this brevity of life and this consciousness of the moment. So you really are inhaling every minute, every second of the day. And carrying with you through life an enthusiastic, positive attitude. When that life deals you out that big, big bucket load of problems, you look it square in the eye and you figure out that that is a set of back bucket of lemonade, I mean lemons that you're going to make lemonade. If you go through life as one of those people that really does consciously try to grab a hold of this notion and turn glasses from half empty to half full, then you're going to be a very happy, successful person because you'll go through life and you'll be much more uh, inspired by your own life. You'll make a tremendous contribution lives of others and communities that you're involved in. And I believe at the end of the day, you'll be one of the few that truly is successful and happy in life, which is what I wish and hope for all of you. Thank you very much. God bless you.
first of all, I would like to ask for those in the audience who were honored in 2007 as one of the 100 incredible women. For those that are here today, please stand and be recognized. Don't be shy. welcome you back. Um, somehow we left off four women from your list in the uh, 2007 um, list in the program. And I wanted to read those four names to you and apologize. Beth Everett, Pansy Flood, Barbara Forster, and Deborah Lamb were inadvertently left off that list of 100 women. Thank you. And now we are honoring six additional incredible They've been recognized by their peers as outstanding in their fields. All of them attended the university. While their educational experiences here were diverse, the roles that they now play across the state and nation share a common thread. They are all leaders. They bring honor to East Carolina and to themselves. We welcome them and we salute their accomplishments. I would ask that you please hold your applause until all uh, six have been recognized. Dr. Sylvia T. Brown, 75-78, Dean of the East Carolina University College of Nursing, and a widely published scholar, considers her greatest accomplishment to be her role in preparing future nurses. She helped to develop the nursing education concentration in the ECU master's program, an option that prepares future nurse educators. She also was instrumental in the development of the ECU doctoral program in nursing. Dr. Brown has written or co-authored more than 75 peer-reviewed articles and proceedings and 27 funded research grants. She served as president of the Dream Factory of North Carolina an organization that grants dreams to chronically and critically ill children and is a board member of the National Dream Factory. Dr. Brown has also been president of the Beta New Chapter of Sigma Beta Tau International and Honor Society for Nurses. Holly M. Garriott. 0105, founder and executive director of Emerge Gallery, which became the Pitt County Arts Council at Emerge in 2009, is also a ceramics artist when time permits. She was invited to create an ornament for the White House Christmas tree in 2008. Garriott has served on the Board of Arts North Carolina, an arts advocacy organization. She developed an internship and professional development course for the ECU School of Art and Design. Each semester, approximately 20 students serve as interns at the Arts Council to gain professional experience in the arts. She serves as Secretary of Uptown Greenville, an organization dedicated to revitalizing downtown, and has also helped coordinate the annual Pirate Fest, an arts and music festival that draws more than 20,000 people to Greenville. Dr. Mary Helen Hackney, 88, Associate Professor in the Division of Hematology Oncology in the Department of Internal Medicine at the Virginia Commonwealth University Massey Cancer Center. Specializes in the, uh, excuse me, the treatment of all stages of breast cancer. She also teaches residents and health professionals about prevention, long-term patient management, and survivorship issues. She received the Women in Science, Dentistry, and Medicine Professional Achievement Award from WISDA in 2009. For several years, she has been recognized as one of Richmond Magazine's top doctors in medical oncology and in women's health breast cancer care. Dr. Hackney serves as director of the Rural Cancer Outreach Program sponsored by the Cancer Center. This program provides oncology care in rural areas of Virginia. She was also a longtime volunteer physician and now provides support as needed at the Crossover Ministries Clinic, which serves uninsured Richmond residents. <laughs> Ma
Margie P. Johnson, 69, is president of Shop Talk, a retail and research consulting firm concentrating on the retail, hospitality, healthcare, and financial industries. As a speaker, trainer, author, and consultant, she equips entrepreneurs with the knowledge and skills that lead them to higher profitability and performance. Johnson was a partner and general manager of the Galleon Esplanade and secretary and treasurer of Cabana East, a corporation owning several businesses on the North Carolina coast. Her accolades include the Fred Lazarus National Retail Federation Award, the North Carolina Employer of the Year Award, the Inside Business 2006 Women in Business Achievement Award, and the 1998 Outstanding Women of Hampton Roads Award. She received coverage in the Washington Post, WHRO Public Television, and NBC's Today Show.
been educated, inspired, motivated about making your dreams come true and then trying to help someone else make their dreams come true. We've tried to give you a special day of learning, of laughter, and fellowship. So please give us feedback on if we've met that goal for you. I'd like to ask Kay to come over here to the uh, raffle ticket men. And for the lovely Howard Miller cherry mantle clock, from Boston Sun. We'll draw a ticket.
And number two, she has the most incredible voice, and so you need to hear that gift. Allison studied voice here at ECU just a few years ago, and is now Professor Emeritus at Fort Hay State University, and has performed for more than 35 years at the Grandfather Mountain Highland Games in North Carolina as both a communist and soloist. Her students have ranged from Broadway stars to elementary teachers. So if you will join me in standing for the ECU alma mater, and then we wish you a safe journey home. Thank you. 